So far in our series, we've examined jazz's misty origins in the lower wards of New Orleans and its first tentative steps out of the Big Easy up the Mississippi to Memphis, St. Louis and Chicago. Then its advance to and retreat from New York City. In this episode, we examine some of the music and the personalities who took jazz from the gilded jazz age through the hypercharged swing era and to the doorstep of bebop. It was a time of insouciance and moral panics, of genius and accident, and of the lamp of inspiration hidden under the bushel of a thousand popular mediocrities, and there was never another time like it. The press would refer to Paul Whiteman as the king of jazz, but Whiteman took great pains to vociferously disown the sobriquet. Famously kind-hearted and avuncular, Whiteman was not just a popularizer of jazz, although so popular was he that at one point there were 35 Paul Whiteman orchestra franchises across the country. He was a genuine advocate for the music. He tended to use large ensembles and attempted to fuse his symphonic training with the immediacy and feel of jazz, but that didn't mean that his music was stiff and formal. It was frequently mischievous and full of fun. Whiteman began making records in 1920, racking up an extraordinary number of huge sellers in the early part of the decade, including some critically important ones. His 1920 Wang Wang Blues is the tipping point, perhaps, between the fading of ragtime as America's favourite dance music and the rise of jazz. His collaborations with George Gershwin on Rhapsody in Blue are masterpieces, and his recording of Old Man River with Paul Robeson is legendarily famous. Incidentally, a short time before that, he'd cut a much faster version of Old Man River with Bing Crosby, which became his first ever number one. It was his arrangement of the Charleston, which became what most people think of 1920s music to be. Whiteman was also very possibly the first great star of radio, although it's hard to imagine the puny beams of radio then bringing a broader audience than just the tri-state region. Whiteman remained a chart force to be on the end of World War II. He retired in 1957 to raise horses and passed away in 1967. More famous as the band leader who lured Louis Armstrong away from King Oliver and his then base in Chicago, precipitating the shift in the balance of power jazz-wise between the two cities. Fletcher Henderson was in fact a highly influential and much respected figure in the development of jazz and its evolution away from ragtime. He only employed Louis Armstrong for a year, Armstrong leaving because he didn't like playing to noted arrangement and he felt that the other East Coast musicians were pretentious. While Henderson made a number of outstanding recordings and was an excellent talent scout, giving trumpeters Roy Eldridge, who helped get Billie Holiday and Anita O'Day their starts, and saxmen Coleman Hawkins and Benny Carter their starts, he was a lousy money manager. After a car accident in 1928, he came to rely, eventually almost completely, on his formidable arrangement skills, eventually taking a job with Benny Goodman, providing the charts that in part made Goodman the King of Swing. Henderson died in 1952 after a stroke. Volumes could be written on the Duke and still not cover his incredible impact on popular music over 30 years. This thumbnail sketch is a nugatory introduction to perhaps the greatest ever genius of American popular music. The breadth of his compositional and arranging skills, the depth of his ability to find the best in musicians to record those compositions, and the width of his versatility mark him as utterly unique in the canon of the world's music. Born Edward Kennedy Ellington in Washington, D.C. in 1899 into a house full of music, the Duke, as he was known from age seven, was sneaking into pool halls to hear ragtime and stride piano players at the age of 14. 
1923 engagement in Atlantic City so impressed Booker's that he was hired for a prestigious job at the exclusive club in New York City, where he played for four years, giving him a toehold in the growing Harlem Renaissance movement, the groundswell of African-American art, theatre, poetry, literature and music that had been growing since 1918. In 1927, he moved uptown for an engagement at the legendary Cotton Club, where he stayed for four years, and his reputation both as a band leader and as a recording artist came into full and vivid bloom. Ellington was to create a canon of work of major pieces, perhaps more than any one man in American music, both in these pre-war years and after he teamed up with Billy Strayhorn and his career moved into more ambitious and complex directions and no less brilliant after the Second World War. Duke worked and wrote until the very end, which came from lung cancer in late 1974. After quitting Fletcher Henderson, Louis Armstrong fronted a number of combos from 1925 to 1927. These were known as the Hot Fives, and 1927 and 1928 his Hot Sevens. Starting out as a continuation of King Oliver's New Orleans-style improvisations, where the lead horn played the main melody and the supporting horns played improvised obligatos off the main melody, Armstrong evolved the notion of a band that could play inside and outside, outside supporting wild improvised solos and then stepping inside and taking their own solo. His Hot 7 from 1928 was a little more rigorously organised, playing to noted horn charts, much as the forthcoming swing bands would adopt. 1925 to 1927 Hot Fives were mainly musicians Armstrong either played with in New Orleans or were alumni of King Oliver's group, pianist Lil Harden Armstrong, as well as Kid Ory on trombone, Johnny Dodds on clarinet, Johnny St. Sire on guitar and banjo. It was those five who went on to author the handbook on jazz improvisation and created the defining terms for the music as it still goes forward today. The Hot Sevens were dominated by Armstrong and perhaps the first genius of jazz piano, Earl Father Hines. Membership was more flexible than the Fives, but Armstrong and Hines and the Dodds Brothers Jr. and Baby and Johnny St. Sire were the spine. Hines was almost Armstrong's equal as a soloist and Baby Dodds was the first real jazz drummer, but drums still sounded lousy on wax in those days. There was a year and a half gap between the Hot Five and the first Hot Seven recordings. They surpassed the Hot Fives for sheer quality and inventiveness of the armstrong Hines axis, but history tends to remember better the wild, trailblazing sounds of Armstrong's Hot Five. They say of Beiderbeck, that his cornet tones sounded like a woman saying yes. Just as rock and roll needs its damned and debauched wild men and country music its tragic, drunken poets and ramblers, jazz needs dark, doomed princes. Those too beautiful to live too long in this world. Born in Davenport, Iowa in 1903, a Mississippi River town, much like Memphis or St. Louis, last stop on the journey of jazz, jazz and blues migrating from New Orleans. And that, along with records that his older brother brought home from World War I, seemed to have been the impetus for Beiderbeck switching from piano and taking up cornet. He was a brilliant self-taught pianist. Check out his 1927 recording of his own composition, In a Mist. In the early 1920s, he drifted to Chicago and played on occasions with Jelly Roll Morton's orchestra. After joining the Wolverine Orchestra, he had a number of promising professional gigs, including one with Paul Whiteman, but they all fell through as his drinking gradually destroyed him. Oh, but the solos he left behind us. Hoagie Carmichael, one of Beiderbeck's true friends, 
wrote Stardust based on a snatch of notes he heard by De Beck riffing one day. Bing Crosby sounded him as a seminal influence. But he dies, barely 28 years old, during a heat wave in Queens, stricken by pneumonia and the delirium tremens. And as befits his legend as the mysterioso of jazz, he's forgotten until the early 1970s when a new appreciation for the richness and invention of his work, plus an analytical approach to telling his true story, finally saw him elevated to the position for the respect he much deserves. A man whose music was as irrepressible as his personality, Chick Webb was the first of jazz's band-leading super drummers, paving the way for Gene Krupa, Buddy Rich and Louis Belson to become band leaders in their own right. Joe Jones was an immediate contemporary of Webb and a huge personality, but he forewent his own ambitions out of loyalty to his leader, Count Basie. In 1935, looking for a new singer, he discovered what he called a diamond in the rough, Ella Fitzgerald. One of the most influential men in the evolution of rock and roll, Lewis Jordan got his big break playing with him from 1935 to 1938. Remarkable a drummer as he was, and terrifically energetic as the music he played was, Webb suffered from tuberculosis of the spine and literally had to be lashed into his drumming chair for shows, and then after them frequently revived with oxygen. Webb's shows, and particularly his drum solos, were wild, thundering affairs, especially a legendary set he played at the Savoy Ballroom in the Battle of the Bands, an annual contest between the best of the best. Webb lost to Duke Ellington in 1937, but in 1938 he beat Count Basie, who came away saying he was just thankful he hadn't been embarrassed. But Webb's health was failing at this point. Through most of 1938, he kept on playing because he knew his band needed work through the Depression. But by June, he'd met the end of the road. His final words were reported as being, I'm sorry, I have to go. <laughs> 